Howdy, my name is Heather Prestridge. I am a collections manager at the Biodiversity Research and Teaching Collections in the Department of Ecology and Conservation Biology at Texas A&M. So I serve to help manage the specimen collections of mammals and birds, and that is everywhere from preparing new specimens, acquiring old specimens from collections that may not have resources to take care of them, digitizing data, mobilizing mobile data so that people can use our resources, and physically sending those resources around the globe to researchers that need materials from our collection. So each year I do an annual report that actually reports on the actual number of specimens that we have that are registered in our collections. For birds, we have 35,000 specimens and growing rapidly for our mammal collection, we have 68,000 specimens. But we also have collections of fishes and reptiles and amphibians and marine invertebrates. Fishes surpassed a million specimens last year. Reptiles and amphibians is sitting at about 112,000 and our marine invertebrate collection is about 250,000 specimens. So we are two million plus um, and a lot of moving pieces. So we're working with you know, salvage specimens from Lights Out, with specimens that go through a rehab facility and don't make it through, and we're also dealing with things that we actively collect. So we're sitting in the collection of birds and we have a California condor specimen that's a recent acquisition with the help of friends from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So it's really rare to be able to add one of those to the collections. We also have wonderful international collections here from South Africa, Benin. We've done some work in Italy our ornithologist is actually in Cameroon right now. Those international specimens coming back to the States being legally imported provides our domestic researchers with like a vast array of specimens that would be difficult for them to otherwise go and get. So once they're imported into the U.S., we can share them easily, but U.S. researchers either going to a different country or going to a museum to subsample tissues to bring back is mostly cost prohibitive. Some of the things that we do is we do subsampling from other museums and bring a set back to the states for folks to use here. What kind of research is being done with the specimens is that we document biodiversity over space and time. So a lot of times people come out here and we open a specimen cabinet and they're like, wow, why do you have so many of that same thing? But each specimen will be from a different place in time. Maybe we think that there might be a new species, a cryptic species. We would collect a series to where we have enough genetic information available to make that assessment. Discovery of species is one thing that we do here. Disease ecology is something else. We network with a couple different groups on campus and around the globe to look at things like avian malaria, avian bornavirus. We also look at host parasite interactions. Yeah, so kind of you name it, if it can be done with a natural history collection specimen, we're here to be used and we're here also actively engaged in that research. Every Friday we do bird specimen preparation. Because we see a lot of salvaged birds, it's a way for us to contribute those into our research collections for others to use. Uh, so right now we have on our dry erase board that we have to save owl hearts for the Shubat Center for Avian Health because they're looking at Chagas disease. We're saving owl livers for Texas Tech because they're looking at rodenticide prevalence in owl specimens. And sometimes we save GI tracts. We're saving brains for another researcher who is developing a vaccine for avian bornavirus. What is the process of skinning and stuffing birds or mammals or preparing really anything for a natural history collection? I think the overall scope is that you want to create something that is stable, that is preserved well, that's sturdy. The process is long. It's not necessarily something that everyone gets. I always say you can come into the prep process and if you can thread a needle and peel a sticker, you're going to be okay. Maintaining the data with the specimen, having something that's sturdy, having something that's not going to disintegrate over a short period of time is what we're looking for. Just the climate that the specimens are stored in is like the number one thing that we try to manage. In the mid-90s, there was a flood event where our collections in the basement were flooded. We were fortunate to be able to move out to the space that we're in now, but yeah, that was a big kind of natural history collection disaster of 
everything's wet. Working with the built environment and potential damage is something that, that all natural history collections deal with. So behind me you see specimen cabinets that are nice and white and clean. They all have gaskets, um, the doors close. They look like they're refrigerators, but they're not. They're just very safe cabinets for our specimens to be inside. So for the dry specimens, making sure that there aren't any pests. For new specimens that are coming into the collection, we make sure that they're properly freezer fumigated and also chemically fumigated before they go into our specimen cabinets, making sure they don't bring any extra pests with them. Facility is always a huge challenge. Humidity, light, exposure to pests, all of those things are threats to natural history collections. And that's why it's important to have people consistently in the cases and working with the specimens like we do on the daily out here. As the more eyes on, on the specimens, the better. I kind of grew up in the department. My undergraduate is from 1997, and our collections were stored in the Evans Library on campus at that time, so I had no idea that we had these wonderful collections. Fast forward to graduating and then coming back to work in the department, I discovered that we had these great collections, and it was kind of an environment that I liked working in. I always say that I got my job here because I was computer literate, which is very true. So wildlife and fisheries back at that time was not necessarily the most cutting edge in terms of technology and databasing. And I started doing some digital illustration work and then they kind of roped me into the collections and fast forward 20 plus years. I got a master's degree along the way working on reptile and amphibian trade. So analyzing large trade databases from US Fish and Wildlife. So that helps me learn skills on importing and exporting specimens, which is really important. And then I just continue to learn. So one of our recent large projects, we were CT scanning specimens. So then I got to go to workshops and learn how to use CT visualization software. A lot of it is on the job, learn how to do it on your own, but there is this background in wildlife and fisheries sciences. So I would say for educating yourself for being in a position like I am, there's a lot of hands-on and volunteering that you can do, but there's also museum studies degrees. Being highly computer literate, especially in this day and age with how we're using specimens differently is really important. So being able to work with large data sets, educating yourself in kind of the digital space that we tend to work in now is important. What skills have I gained while working at the collections? I've learned to prepare specimens. It's what we do every Friday. So we're working on some salvage birds this Friday. And I'm also training. There's four people that are new to that weird task. I definitely flex my networking skills out here, bringing undergraduates in to work in the collections as a volunteer or an intern. Some of the students that I meet their freshman year are still around. And it's great to have, you know, I'm like, I'm, so, so excited when a freshman comes in because I know I'm going to have them for more than just a semester. For the students that are preparing things, having them prepare a series of all of the same things is helpful in training them. The other thing that we do is sometimes we help newbies finish their bird, which is kind of unheard of in the bird skinning and stuffing world. Isn't it great to learn from a real thing? So our specimens are used in all of our courses taught by the Ecology and Conservation Biology Department. So everything from mammalogy and ornithology, herpetology, ichthyology, I always say all the ologies meet out here. Specimens are used for students to examine them and look at the characteristics to be able to identify different species. You can pick something up and turn it over and handle it gently. You know, there's scale, there's texture, there's things that are different on e different characters on each species. The hands-on experience is so very important. If, if you're a student that comes through and has one lab out here, you get a, a peek into what we do. If you're a student that comes around the corner into my cubicle and says, do you need some help out here? Um, you get a, a completely different experience. You just scratch the surface if you take a class where there are specimens there, but if you work to prepare the specimens, you're going to learn a different suite of, um, of information from that specimen. All right, and that's all the questions I have here. Super duper. Yeah. Back where Shabuzi started. <laughs> <laughs> You're so right! This is, this is... This is